<laughs> hey, uh, thanks everybody for coming to BrewCon and coming to my talk. This is Anti Forensics AF. Uh, I named it that because when I would read those memes that were like, that's stupid AF or that's silly AF, I always first read it as, that's stupid anti forensics or that's silly anti forensics. Uh, my brain is weird. Uh, so, my name is Int80, I'm the rapper in Dual Core. Um, you might have heard our song, Drink All the Booze, Hack All the Things. That's me with the mustache rapping it. Uh, I've made a number of anti forensics presentations. Um, the last time I was here in 2012, I debuted, I think it was either my second or third anti forensics presentation. Um, I love to troll uh, people in general, and um, I have a lot of fun trolling uh, federal agencies where I live in the U.S., FBI and NSA, but that's a different, different conversation. If you guys see me at the party tonight, we can talk more about it, I guess. Um, so here's what we're going to cover today. I'm actually going to pick up where I left off from the last time I was at BrewCon. We'll look at some anti-forensics stuff you can do uh, running in memory as like the context of being an attacker on a system. So if you've got some malware that you don't want to be acquired or analyzed by a forensics investigator or an IR team, uh, you have some tools at your disposal. So we'll take a look at uh, what you can do with both in Windows and Linux. Uh, then we'll look at some Android stuff. I'll talk a little bit about Android forensics, but we're going to try to cruise through that part quickly because A, it's painful, and B, it's kind of boring. Uh, and then we'll look at some anti-forensic stuff you can do on Android in case like your phone gets picked up, get raided, or something like that. And then uh, the last part, we're going to play a CTF. Uh, fun with SD cards, kind of this neat little trick that uh, my friend Craig Smith from Open Garages put me onto. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll all have a good time. Uh, so I'm not a professional. I don't do forensics for a living. I've never done forensics uh, professionally. Um, I'd love, like I said, I love to troll and just mess around. Basically, I'm just like some guy, and I sit down at my computer, and I'm like, what happens if I do this? And that's basically it's dog science on the keyboard all day. Uh, so I'm not an expert at all. Uh, and your mileage may vary. You'll probably come up with better adjustments or modifications to the ideas that I present here. Um, and then in the US, we have the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So pretty much any kind of computer research you do can easily be illegal. But all the cool things that I know how to do on computers, I've learned by doing them illegally. So do illegal things. <coughs> OK, let's talk about memory forensics. So uh, I work on a red team currently, and um, my thought about memory forensics was focusing on software protection, uh, but from the context of malware, right? So I'm on red team. I don't use like MSF Venom. Uh, we write our own malware. And to dev like a whole new tool chain, that's a lot of investment in resources, right? Um, so we don't want any kind of uh, malware getting picked up or analyzed uh, by our blue team. So in order to do that, uh, we employ different techniques to try to keep ourselves hidden or uh, prevent analysis, anti-forensics. So um, from the thought of uh, being a malware author or being a red team operator, uh, you're trying to invoke software protection techniques uh, for your malware to protect your malware. So uh, with memory forensics, right, like we all know like dead disk forensics are the, the old and busted for the last 10 years or so, memory forensics has been the hotness. So uh, the thing that's neat is, in the context of malware, when you're on disk and your malware is not loaded yet, you need all of the sections uh, in your executable file to go from disk into memory. But once you're in memory, you don't necessarily need all of these sections. The trick is that analysis tools, like IDA Pro, stuff like that, they need those sections in order to be able to quick, uh, correctly parse out the format of the executable file and begin an analysis of your code. So if I don't need those sections, I can get rid of them, and then the analysis tools aren't able to use them. So if they're no longer referenced, we don't need them. Execution will continue correctly, and uh, the analysis tools get really upset, and there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. <laughs> Uh, so for my first demo, I'm actually going to demo a, a tool that I showed at last BrewCon that I was at. Uh, it's called The Keys Are Like Right Next to Each Other. Um, and it's from this bash.org excerpt. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start our malware. In this case, the keys are like right next to each other.exe. We'll dump memory with recall, which is an open source framework provided by Google. And then uh, we'll try to get the malware out of memory and see if we can analyze it. Cool. 
OK. So let's see. Here's my Windows VM. Let's kick off our malware. All right, so this is our malware. It's just running. No big deal. And over here, let's dump memory. So we're going to use winpmem, which you can get for free online. And I'm just going to create this dump file, lol.aff4. So this runs. It actually takes some time. So while we're doing that, let's just watch a video. It's corn season. Neato. Shucking. It's a fancy word for peeling, and how you shuck is a personal choice. The traditional method is to grab the husk and shuck downward. Repeat this motion until the cob is husk free. You can also up shuck it. These methods are hard work and you end up shucking yourself silly, so consider trying the golf shuck. Corn! Or you can try playing shuckminton. Or you can use a comprehensive spinning wheel dual momentum shuck system. Or you can bucket shuck it. <laughs> you can throw it against a rock. Whoops, don't throw it against a rock. Or if you're quick enough, you can do the falcon shuck. The Shuckatron 6 is new technology that's based on particle theory and magic. You just slide it through there and just make sure to wash the particles off of your corn after because particles aren't good for you. And if you don't like corn on the cob, you can take a hammer and get corn off the cob. Or you can buy this corn I've been developing with Monsanto. It's uh, cobless corn and the way we make it is through genetic engineering and it's perfectly healthy and safe, we're pretty sure. Or you can try this corn sausage we've been making. It looks and tastes like real turkey sausage and the way we make that is by having a turkey f a cob of corn. To cook the corn, a lot of people think you just fill a pot with water, boil the water, throw in the corn, add some salt, let it cook for a few minutes and then it's done. And those people are correct. Applying butter to your corn is also a personal decision. Rookies will use a knife, which is a sloppy way to go about it, and it leaves your corn tasting like butter and metal. This is the classic way. You just gently roll your cob in the butter until it's coated. A more advanced way is to take a slab of butter and carve a cornhole into the side. Slide your cob into the cornhole and twist it while moving it in and out until your cob is completely coated with butter. If your cornhole isn't big enough, gently twist it with perseverance until it slides through easily. You can also stick butter onto some tongs, tape those to a broom handle, and butter your corn from a distance. This is a great technique if you suffer from a strong fear of corn. Butter corn can be slippery, so be sure to attach a handle like this 2.71A Phillips screwdriver. I just made up the 2.71A part. But yeah, that's corn on the cob, and it's more delicious than corn on the log or corn in the bog, or corn on the saw, or corn on the dog, or corn in the fog, or corn on the job, or corn in the clog, or corn on Bob, or corn on the slob, which is the same thing. Get your shit together, Bob, seriously. And it's obviously best eaten as corn on the knob. And if you're sick of corn, consider trying HelloFresh. <laughs> All right, so I think we should have a memory dump now. Yay. All right. Cool. Okay, so we've got our memory, and malware is still running, right? So we should be able to get a copy of malware. So let's start up recall. So recall is basically almost like having an IPython notebook. Anybody use IPython? It's dope. You get tab completion and all the goodness of Python. Um, so here we are in this prompt where we, <laughs> uh, where we have tab completion and everything. So um, all we need is this, oh, sorry, this proc dump manual or uh, module. And you can even specify just a regular expression. And like, if you use volatility, you're going to need the process ID to dump out the target malware process. But in this case, we only need a regex. So we'll say the keys, because we know that's, that's what it's called in this case. And then we'll specify our dump directory. So we'll just put it in our desktop. And let's see what we get. I think we'll get like some distorm warnings, because I don't have the distorm Python modules installed, but we should get a dump file. And I guess I'll show you guys real quick. This is what the regular malware looks like, just loaded off disk statically before it's been run. Um, so it's IDA, you know, easy call graph. Our uh, functions are declared. You know, you've got cross references. You can click into functions. So no big deal, right? Everything's everything's cool there.
And let's see. Cool. So uh, here's our output. Executable, the keys are like 1712, which is probably the PID.exe. So looks like we've dumped it. Let's try to open it. Executable, the keys are like 1712. MS-DOS com file. Hmm, that doesn't seem right. And that definitely doesn't look the same as what we loaded. So if you're going to do analysis on this, and you're a forensic investigator, and you have IDA Pro, and you know enough to maybe start hitting C to get things to uh, identify as code, you know, none of these instructions look the same as our other disassembly, right? So this stuff isn't disassembling. Here's like a, a 45A that it you know, thinks might be uh, an MS-DOS header, maybe. But like, this stuff isn't code, right? It's just a blob of data. So how are you going to do analysis on this? Um, I, I don't know. For, for myself, I don't know. I, again, I don't do forensics professionally, but I know that this one doesn't look like the disassembly that I just showed you guys. And our malware is still running. So we're still winning as Red Team. Good job, us. We beat the forensics investigators. All right. So uh, let's take a look at what that looks like under the hood, because it's actually pretty easy. All right, so first off, we're just uh, resolving um, our uh, MS-DOS header, then our PE header, checking the magic bytes, right, 45A, for you, those of you that are into forensic stuff like that, 50 null null, uh, or 50 null for um, the PE header. And then all we do is call virtual protect and add write permissions onto our header. Then we call this guy RTL0 memory, which zeroes out the entire header. This is in memory, right? So on, on disk, the file's still the same, but if you're operating in memory, um, all that header information is gone, so now you don't know where the sections are. Uh, you don't know like what data is what. Restore the per, uh, protections or permissions with virtual protect again. And then in this case, we're just proof of concept looping just so the malware stays executing. That's it. That's easy. And, and we won. All it takes is changing header permissions and zeroing out the headers. Cool. Good job, us. All right. Cool. Um, so yeah, again, the PE header, all the section data, that's all needed to load from disk into memory, but once we're in memory, we don't need it, so we just zero it out. Uh, again, process execution continues. We maintain persistence. Uh, we keep getting our shells. We're doing awesome. And this works all the way from Windows XP all the way up through Windows 10, right? That VM is Windows 10, so this is still a valid technique. Uh, for completeness, uh, this is, these are the commands we ran, so um, you guys at home can screenshot it or whatever. Uh, but we dumped memory with WinPmem. We ran recall against the dump so that we could try to dump the malware out. And then that was our proc dump module uh, command to try to get the dump of the executable file. Any questions on what we did with the, the Windows stuff? Cool. <laughs> All right, let's look at Linux. I generally operate in a Linux environment, so I feel more comfortable there. That said, I'll probably mess up this demo and get the Windows one without issue, so. <laughs> Password is 1337, same as my luggage code. All right, uh, let's see where we're at here. So let's kick off the malware. This one is uh, a Linux variant of the keys are like right next to each other. So this is just debugging output. Um, found our elf header, zeroed out the bytes. Cool. Now we're doing evil stuff, as we do. All right. Let's see. Uh oh, where's it at? There it is. All right. So. Cool. 
Let's insmod lime. And so lime is a kernel module that's open source available on GitHub and it will um, dump memory for you. So let's dump it into this lol.lime file in temp and we'll tell it that the format is lime. I think you can also give it format as raw. And double checking, cool, still doing evil stuff. Great, awesome, so we dumped RAM, that was fast. Uh, let's see. All right, so I'll make a quick caveat note here. Um, when you wanna use volatility in Linux, you need to build a profile for the system that you've dumped RAM off of uh, that you're gonna be conducting the analysis against. So uh, in this case, I've already built it, but I'll show you how in the slides what the step-by-steps are. But you can grep for it really quickly just by running with dash dash info, and then this is your profile name. So let's get our malware out of memory. Or try, at least. Spoiler alert, we're not gonna get it. <laughs> All right, so first, give it the memory dump. Tell it our profile. And then let's do a Linux PS list for our module. That way we can get our PID. Oh, there's a distorm. Okay. So let's see. Here it is. The keys are like right next to each other. PID is 1993. All right. So now let's do Linux proc dump. We'll dump it into temp. And oops, that's not what I wanted. And the PID is 1993. Cool. Looks like it dumped. No, no warnings, no errors, right? Exit code is zero, so seemingly everything's legit. So let's take a look. And there's our memory dump, lol.lime, and here's our malware dump. Let's run file against it, see what we got. Oh no. It's empty. Oh no, there's no bytes. We got nothing out of the malware, but malware is still running. Good job, red team. We're winning. Uh, I will note that um, A Case, uh, who is like the main author of Volatility, he mentioned to me on Twitter that he says he's got a, a workaround for this on uh, Windows, and so um, I have. I just have yet to play with it, but uh, I haven't seen a workaround for it yet in Linux. I assume that the Windows attempt is probably comparable to what I would try in Linux to try to make this work, but so far, nobody's caught my malware. Good job. Uh, okay, and let's take a look at what this looks like under the hood. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, here we are finding the executable header, right? Uh, here I'm finding my memory address in, in memory, but I'm doing it like a really cheap way because I'm lazy. So this is, this is really bad, and I, and I should feel bad uh, that I'm doing it this way, but it works. So I'm opening self maps, and so basically that gives me uh, a readout of like all the memory pages that are mapped for my process. And that may not be available, right? I've, I've been on systems where there is no proc, like, or I can't access proc. So I, that's a very un, unrobust way of doing it, but I'm lazy and it works in, in most cases. Uh, Fscanf to find our page that we're interested in. Uh, and then here we go, mProtect, just like we had virtual protect in Windows, right? Setting uh, the permissions on the header page with write so that we can write to it. Memset, which is the same thing that RTL zero memory calls under the hood, so we're zeroing out um, the header. And then restoring the processes back with mProtect. And then pr proof of concept looping down here. So pretty easy. Any questions on the Linux stuff? Yes. If you dump from memory? Oh, I mean, uh, so yes, you could you could dump the the whole like you could DD out of the memory image, right? And you could say like this is uh, so. The question is, what if we dump like 
a whole block of memory, like out of the memory acquisition. We just like DD this whole chunk of memory and we like try to throw that into IDA. And the answer is we get like pretty much the same thing that happens in Windows. We'd say like, this is where this file starts and it would be like, here's some bytes. IDA would be like, here's some bytes. I don't know what they are. And so you wouldn't get a clean disassembly. Um, cool. So that was the Linux stuff. <laughs> Uh, same stuff with the windows, right? Uh, we, we don't need the header after we've loaded and we're in memory. Uh, we zero it out, this time with memset. Process continues to run, so we're doing great. And analysis tools fail. That's always fun. Uh, for the folks that want to follow along at home, uh, this is how you get Lime set up. So you just git clone it right out of GitHub. A simple make will um, make it. And then uh, insmod will do the acquisition, uh, load it up into, load the kernel module and do the acquisition for you all at the same time. Then on to volatility, uh, volatility also in GitHub. So simple, clone it, and then Python setup.py, install. It's pretty boilerplate. Then uh, this is for making your profile. Um, so once you've, once you've got volatility uh, and you've got like your target system, you'll go into this tools Linux subdirectory and you'll run make and that will get you this module.dwarf file. That'll be the output from running make. And you can run head on module.dwarf, and one of the first things you should see is this .debug underscore info string. That'll let you know that you've, you're good to go. You're ready to roll. Uh, and so then, after making the module.dwarf file, uh, you'll just need to copy that into the volatility um, directory. <laughs> so, uh, you actually package the module.dwarf with the current system.map. And so again, this is all for like the, the target system that you want to acquire and an analyze RAM on, right? Um, package that up, drop that into the volatility subdirectory, and then running that first command that I ran with the dash dash info, you can grep for Linux and you should see your profile in there. And then these are the last things we did, just the PS list, and that gets us our PID of the target process that we want to dump and then proc dump um, to get the, the memory out or attempt to. So the, the technique that uh, Andrew Case mentioned to me on Twitter was grafting like your own uh, ELF header onto, or your own PE header onto the Windows binary. And in this case, you could try grafting like an ELF header on. Um, I still don't know how effective that would be because you'd still need all the offsets for like, you know, how big is this section and what sections are available and stuff like that. Uh, I, I guess I should just admit right now, like, I, I've had all this research for a while, and I just had the idea one day of, like, having screaming goats for the slide transitions, and I was like, this would be hilarious, I bet. And so that's basically why I made this presentation, just so I could share screaming goats with everyone. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> should be like, boo this man. Okay, so Android stuff. Uh, Android, all of my Android stuff revolves around using encryption on your phone. And uh, I guess before I go into that, I'll also mention uh, the Grux Sage advice of use Tor, use Signal. My advice would have been lawyer up and hit the gym and delete Facebook, but you know, use Tor, use Signal. Uh, this one is, I want to eat a pint of Jerry Garcia ice cream. Should I use a bowl or not? Use Tor, use Signal. And selling social security numbers for Bitcoin, please contact me on my XMPP. Use Tor, use Signal. <laughs> okay, Android stuff. Okay, um, so I guess we'll cruise through Android Forensics really fast so that uh, we can do the SD card stuff because like I said, Android Forensics kind of sucks. <laughs> okay, uh, so 
my, my girlfriend and I had this like, you know, hey, let's learn about Android forensics. And we we're like, okay, how do we do acquisition? How do we do analysis? And it turns out acquisition is a big pain in the butt. Uh, if you want to get like the NAND storage off of, um, off of a device, you need all these things in place. If, if, you want, if you want RAM, you need config modules as well. Um, but you basically need to cross-compile Netcat, dump it onto the device, and then dump the storage off through Netcat through a pipe. It's a pain. In, in order to get all of that working, the device needs power, needs to be decrypted, needs to be unlocked, right? Like, so it can't have the lock screen currently enabled. Uh, needs to be rooted, and you need USB debugging. I mean, that's a heck of a kill chain. And then if you want memory, like what's actually running like in memory on the device, you also need loadable kernel modules enabled in the kernel. I've never seen any Android device with that built in, so I don't know like how you would go about getting memory off of a live Android device. <laughs> okay, so um, what we do is we cross-compile Netcat with like an ARM tool chain, right? Because the Android devices are generally running ARM processors. You push the Netcat binary up onto the Android device, set up a forwarder, in this case on ports 4444, add executable permissions, and then you DD into a pipe, piping to Netcat, <laughs> uh, into a Netcat listener, and then from your laptop, you use Netcat as a client to connect into the listener over USB and dump out the image. It's like the craziest forensics methodology I've ever seen in my life. But it does work, like you can get the NAND off of the device, like all the flash storage, so, you know, right on. Uh, but the thing that just blows my mind about this is you're putting a file on a device that you want to image, right? Like if, you, if somebody gave you a hard drive and they were like, acquire all the data off of this hard drive, I need an image of this hard drive, you would, your first thought wouldn't be like, oh yeah, let me go put this program on it real quick, right? You would like plug up a write blocker and you would just read only off of the device. In this case, we're like, hold on, let me go add stuff onto this device real fast. Ah! Ah! Uh, okay, so uh, another note is uh, NAND gets shown differently on different devices. Like I've got a Nexus 7, I've got an S5, I've got this S3. Uh, and so basically when I plug up and I'm looking for like the storage, like what, what device do I want to, what interface do I want to grab all the data off of, I've seen like all of these. So uh, if you look under proc partitions on the device, that'll tell you where that NAND storage is exposed so that you can, you can grab it correctly. And that last one I was just trying to be clever because I know C++. Cool joke. Okay, so say we don't have root on the device, right, but we want a logical acquisition. We can still get a lot of good stuff. Uh, ADV pull slash, right, that'll try to pull all the files off of the root, part, or, uh, root, root mount, root file system. Um, ADV shell dump sys, uh, dump sys will get you stuff, backups will get you stuff. Like, there's all these interesting pieces of data to be had. My brother gifted me Goat Simulator like a few years ago and I've still never played it. <laughs> um, dump state can get you things like uh, uh, information about like the radio and stuff like that, uh, bug report as well. And then there's this other tool called aflogical-ose, which is the open source edition. There's a law enforcement edition as well, which I've never used because I'm not a fed. Uh, and so basically the whole point is like getting an acquisition sucks, right? And nobody wants to go through all those steps. And it's easy to disrupt if you remember all the stuff in our kill chain. That one's not even a goat. Okay. So let's see. Uh, again, using encryption, right? Here's, here's my scenario that like, I'm probably most worried about for my personal threat model. Say that I go out somewhere, I leave the house for once in my life, and I, I'm operating out of my house, or like outside of my house, right? You don't hack a bank across state lines from your house, you get nailed by the feds. Uh, so when you, when you go out and you're hacking stuff or freedom fighting or whatever, uh, you leave your, your cell phone at home, right? But your cell phone has all kinds of interesting stuff on it, so that's evidence. So say that I got raided while I'm out freedom fighting and, um, and law enforcement has acquired my device. I don't want them to get 
any information off of it. Um, deploying a hardware implant, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but so I was thinking about this kill chain, right, of like all of, all of these things that have to be in place for a successful acquisition, right? You have to have the device powered on, uh, it has to be decrypted, has to be unlocked, you need root if you want like a full acquisition off the NAND. So my thought was, cool, like what if I just turn my device off? Because if it's encrypted, then all the data is encrypted again and nobody gets anything. And in the event that, you know, I just come home and like accidentally cause the device to think it's getting picked up by law enforcement, I still want access to all of my files, right? Like it's not really in danger. So I can power it back on and decrypt it myself. It's not a big deal. So, you know, power down the device, everything's encrypted, lawyer up, delete Facebook. Um, cool, so I'm like, great, how can I figure out if I'm in danger? I've got all of these sensors at my disposal, right? Bluetooth, if I leave my house, I can pair my, my Android device to like some other Bluetooth device in my house, and if for some reason law enforcement picks that up and they put it in a Faraday bag, that device is gonna become unpaired. If the Bluetooth becomes unpaired, turn off the device. Everything's encrypted now. If it goes off the cell network, turn off the device. Same thing, like Faraday bag, right? GPS, if it leaves the geofence around my house, turn off the device, everything's encrypted. Somebody picks the phone up, you have to pick it up to put it in the bag turn it off. This is, this is all like so easy, like a, so many ways to win. So uh, I made this app called Duck the Police and uh, all it really does is just turn off the device. <laughs> um, but it uses the sensors that are available and so uh, asserting that my device is encrypted and rooted and I have access to sensors and I started with magnets in there because I don't know how they work and I don't ever do any Android development, so I also didn't know how Android works. Uh, so it's magnets, how do they work? Okay, so uh, this is my nomination for the worst InfoSec conference demo ever. So I have, have my phone here running Duck the Police, which you can all clearly see. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to select movement and I'm going to select Duck the Police and so now my phone is at rest, right? And I'm out operating and freedom fighting. And I set my phone down, it's on my desk, I'm away. And then the FBI comes and they pick up my phone and it's turned off. And that's it. Everything's encrypted and law enforcement gets no data. So great, great demo, right? This is the best. <laughs> but it works. So yeah, duck the police. I, I could only find one picture that said duck the police. These were the closest matches I could find. <laughs> I love that one because a friend of mine, he was telling me like, he's like, oh yeah, like I love to pick locks. He's really good at picking locks. He's like, he's like yeah, you know, the police, they charge $125 to remove the boot from your car. I charge 75. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your OCR now? I love it. Okay, cool. Uh, the other part that I said I mentioned later, deploying hardware implants. Um, one of our favorite things to do as Red Team is to do radius attacks. And so if you work somewhere or you're targeting somewhere that uses radius where employees or victims have to authenticate like with their AD credentials or something like that to the Wi-Fi in order to get on the Wi-Fi. It's awesome to drop an Android device in the bathroom and have it expose its own wireless access point with a radius attack running named after the corporate as access point, right? So let's say you work somewhere like corp, corp corporation, I don't know. And, uh, and you're like, cool, like the SSID for corp corporation is like corp Wi-Fi. So all you do is configure your Android implant to broadcast his own SSID as corp Wi-Fi, put it in the bathroom where it's gonna have a stronger signal than like the corporate Wi-Fi, and people will totally sit down, go to the bathroom, and be like, oh, I just need to log in again, and log in and put in their creds. You go back, collect your hardware implant, you get creds, easy mode. Now in the event that your phone gets found by somebody else, whether it be blue team or janitorial staff or whatever, you don't want that evidence being collected, right? So duck the police or the blue team or the janitorial staff. Although I like the janitorial staff. They open the door for me all the time. They're really nice. All right, CTF time. Um, if you guys have seen this talk already, like if you saw it at 
Hoper, DEF CON, or Derby CON, you're not allowed to play, but for everyone else, you're totally allowed to play. Please be with me, based demo god. Yeah. All right. The hard part is typing the password. <laughs> All right. Cool. Do, do, do. Oh no. Okay, you guys can see that, right? All right, cool. I, I cannot see it. Well, I can kind of see it. All right, so I have this SD card. Galloway phone. All right, SD card, totes legit. Cool, here's this file. Let's cool, the rules of the CTF challenge are easy. You must add your name to the end of this file. Once you have done that, ensure the file is saved and synced and will survive being ejected and remounted. Your success must be validated before you may pass this on to another player. All right, cool, so all we're gonna do is add our name to this text file unmount the SD card, take it out, put it back in, then, then we win, right? We... So just using Vim, I'm using sudo, right? Int80, that's me. Cool, saved. Let's, uh, let's make sure it's still there. Cool, name's still there. All right, let's unmount it. Great, no complaints. SD card is out. SD card going back in. Cool. Oh no, my name's not there. Huh, what can we try? Yes, you can, you can do a DD of the image and you can write your name in, you can DD the image back onto the disk, and it won't work. I, I will just tell you that. It takes a lot of time. <laughs> That's why I won't do it, but it takes a lot of time, and you'll just have to trust me that that doesn't work. The file format? File, file system format. Let's see. Looks like it is extended to. What else can we try? I'm sorry, yell it louder. Look for a hidden file on the USB stick. Or on the SD card. Just the lost and found directory and the challenge.txt. That's lost and found is an artifact of the file system. So no hidden files, just challenge.txt. Yes. Right, yeah, so like if we touch it or like, I mean we're editing it anyways, which is gonna update the timestamps and stuff. Oh yeah, we can, we can create another file if you want. You guys want, like, you wanna try that? Yeah, like let's, let's make a copy, right? Sure, yeah, so uh, we can, okay, so we can, like, we can copy challenge.txt, right? And we'll call it, like, challenge2. We can edit challenge2. And then, do you want to, like, do you want to move it, or do you want to just see if challenge2.txt stays there, or what do you think? Like we could, we could overwrite challenge.txt with challenge2, or we could just see if, it, if challenge2 stays. Oh, okay, copy it back. Sure, yeah. 
All right, cool. So we've copied and overwritten challenge.txt, right? We can verify that. So there's challenge.txt, and we can, like, SHA-1 it. It's fine. Checksums are the same. So we've overwritten. We're good. And we saw that our name is there. Cool. So let's unmount it. Device is out. Device goes back in. Oh, shoot. Let's see if challenge text stayed the same. Yeah, there it is, right? Nope, still no name. Sorry, one sec. Oh yeah, like an overlay or like a like an ADS, like an alternate data stream. Uh, good, good thought. Not what's going on here though, but good thought. Good thought. Yes. Uh, so mount and unmount, or mount and U mount, are the same binaries that are distributed with the distro. So I haven't trojaned mount or U mount, but those are those are also good points. Mount flags. Yeah, or the the mount like entries. So here's our device, dev MMC block zero P1 being the partition. Uh, this is the mount point. Hardware write protected. protected, like the lock switch. Uh, the lock switch is set to unlocked. Uh, I think if you have it set to locked, it'll like complain right away, like you wouldn't be able to, to write the file. So yeah, all, the, all of these are just uh, default, like I haven't, haven't munched any of the, the mount flags at all. In D message? Yeah, let's take a look. Um, mounting, card was removed. All right, so this, these are the last two cycles, right? Uh, here's, here's the card is removed, and then we've mounted the file system again, card is removed, mounted it again. I don't see any warnings or anything. Let's try it. Let's <laughs> see what happens. Uh, okay, so let's see. Let's copy. Yeah, I haven't tried this one. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I have an idea of what will happen. Okay, there it is. Should we, should we edit our local copy? Like, do you think? I mean, all right, we'll just... Boom, there's our name. Okay, cool. And then, let's see, so we'll need to U-mount it, right, so we can format it. I think that's legit, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see what happens. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Hold on to your butts. <laughs> Maybe. Not in this demo, though. I don't have any more, like, cooking videos either, so I hope this goes faster. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you're kind of on the right path, right? So he, what he was saying is like they're like kind of like counterfeit SD cards, and this is kind of what led to this line of research is you'll buy like a card online and it'll be advertised as like 64 gigs, right? But then when you put it in, it's like only shows up as like 16 gigs or 32 gigs. Oh. Right. Yes, yes, exactly. And so I, I misspoke. It does show up as uh, 64 gigs, but it only actually exposes like 16 gigs of storage. And so you're actually right. It's a problem with the firmware. And so that's actually what we're using here is firmware. Um, so I'll just kill this guy. Let 
and see if it killed him. All right, check this out. <laughs> Easy mode. All right, so. Oh, shoot, there it is, even though we did our format, right? <laughs> and our name's not there. Uh, okay, so uh, this gentleman was correct. It's, uh, it's actually an issue with the firmware. So there's an open source tool called SD Tool. And let's see, I should maybe. So if we use SD Tool, we can take a look at the status of the device, and we see that it's currently write protected temporarily. Right, we can update the write protection, and so we can unlock the device. And now, <laughs> now we can reformat it or just write our name on there. All right, unmounted, device is out. Device back in. There's our name. We did it. Yeah. Sweet. All right. So I thought that was like a pretty neat thing for a couple of reasons. A, I, I can't imagine how like infuriating it must be to be a forensic investigator and be like, what? Like all the evidence disappeared off this SD card. <laughs> all right. Uh, oh, that was just to prevent me from going too far. It's that boy. Oh shit, what up? Whoa! <laughs> Uh, cool, so SD tool, uh, you can lock and unlock your device, right? And, and uh, as you asked, the physical lock was disengaged the whole time, right? So we were, we were writing to the device, we were moving files around, we tried formatting the device, and there were no complaints, right? It, it wasn't like the device is like, nah, bro, I'm read-only. The device is telling the OS, like, yeah, everything's cool, you're good, no big deal. The OS is like telling the user, yeah, everything's cool. So um, pretty neat, right? Uh, the TLDR, like, awesome point being no logs, no crime because no logs get written to the device. A uh, couple caveats. So um, you need like an actual MMC device, right? That's why I had to use my second laptop. Um, I, also because my like five minutes of trying to port SD tool onto OS X failed. So uh, I was like, oh, I'll just bring my other laptop. It's easy. Uh, USB hubs, sometimes they, um, like when you have like an all-in-one MMC reader with like compact flash and SD and all that stuff, sometimes they expose themselves only on the USB bus, so you won't be able to use like an all-in-one reader necessarily. Ah! Okay, cool. Uh, so why is this useful? Like what would you do with this? Um, Remember how I talked about like our Android devices, right? Dropping those in the bathroom. Well, like think about using something else, like a Pwn plug or, or like a like a Pwn Pi or something, right? Like a hardware implant that you leave behind, plug up to the network. That's your reverse shell out, right? You run something like a Raspberry Pi with an SD card. Great, like none of your stuff gets written. So everything is like in memory. You're able to like exfil and reverse shell and do all your cool stuff. And if uh, if at any point some blue team or janitorial staff person comes by and picks up your device, all the evidence is gone. You've protected all your evidence. So good for both professionals and unprofessionals. Uh, Portal of Pi, I don't know if you guys have ever used um, uh, Portal by the Gruck, but basically like a, a Tor gateway, uh, funnel all your traffic out through Tor. You can make a build of it for the Raspberry Pi really easy. And so basically I kind of just modified it a little bit, like all of my logs point to DevNull and stuff like that. Uh, set up on your SD card that's lock protected or write protected and none of that stuff gets written. And then uh, attack VMs. So like I, I love having you know disposable VMs that I can just snapshot or get rid of when an operation is over. So if you run your attack VM off of an SD card, you do all your configuration and everything like that, 
all of your actions, all your history, all your logging, everything goes away once the SD card gets unmounted and ejected. That's pretty dope. You can start with a fresh snapshot every single time. I still don't know what this is. What is that? He's there. He's hiding. What kind of animal is this? <laughs> Get up there. Oh, you. Ladder goat. You're so <laughs> random. <laughs> oh, ladder goat. Uh, so here's where you get SD tool. Like I said, open source. Uh, the only modifications that I had to make were to change the make file to use Clang instead of GCC. For some reason, it didn't like my GCC tool, tool chain, but Clang was fine. And then this is the usage. You want to create a status, use status, lock it, and unlock it. So hello from the other side. Okay, then it's uh, time for a break. Please uh, give Dual Cora a round of applause. Yeah, thank you guys.